From Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, this is Bridge Bible Talk, a live call-in program where you can ask questions on current events, the Bible, and Christian faith. Email your questions now to bridgebible at bridgeradio.org. That's bridgebible at bridgeradio.org. You can also watch the live stream by going to ccob.org or live on Facebook at Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge. Now, here's Robert Baltadano and Lloyd Pulley, Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel Old Bridge on Bridging the Gap Radio. Well, good Saturday night to you all. Thanks so much for tuning in. And for those of you online, just want to welcome those online viewers as well. Bridge Bible Talk, here we are, 5 p.m. As you remember last weekend, uh, Pastor Lloyd and myself did mention to you that uh, we're going to be doing this from 5 to 6 on a pre-recorded basis, and so that's what we're doing here today. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're going to be going live very soon, uh, Monday to Friday, 3 to 4, and our launch date is August 3rd. That's what we're praying for. We're hoping that everything will go well with our studios, and so uh, we're going to be launching this 3 to 4. Now, tonight, it's going to be a different uh, program because we're not going to be answering questions uh, like we normally do. We actually have a special program tonight that we want you to be encouraged with, and uh, Basically, Pastor Lloyd and, and our, myself, we have some guests here, and I'm going to actually have Pastor Lloyd introduce the guest here. Pastor Lloyd, who do we have here tonight? Well, I'm really excited that uh, a couple of my dear friends, as well as those that kind of we learned and grew ministry together, I see the Lord developing them. And uh, Joe DiProsimo is a well, was a former police officer and pastor of Calvary Chapel Crossfields. Uh, went out in 2003, three and. Uh, Pastor Raymond Dash, I, I don't know if many calls you Raymond, I call you Ray, <laughs> but I usually get formal on these things. So Ray Dash, he's a pastor of the Rock Christian Fellowship in Newark, and, uh, and you've been pretty active too with a lot of the stuff going on because you've had in your own community some challenges with this whole racial thing. So I'm excited that they're here because we want to just have some frank talk about some of the things we're going through in uh, with COVID, with ministry, how the church responds in times of crisis. So that's what we're going to do. Right. And so we're still going to take your questions for next week. So feel free to send us questions either through the number 732-479-0557 or email us at bridgebible at bridgeradio.org. Send those questions in. We're hoping to get to those questions next week. So if you sent questions this week, you know, we apologize. But we think that at this time, you know, during the times that we're living in, we want to have a program that we can address some things. And I'm praying that this will be an encouragement to you because our heart here is Jesus. That, that's what we want. We want to focus on Christ and uh, how the church responds to these uncertainties. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Pastor Lord, I know you had some questions for, for our guests. Well, you know, I just, I guess the best part about this is that we've, we've known each other for a number of years. And, you know, this is the challenge, I think, as pastors. We want people to see people. You know, we are so divided in groups. And now this latest thing, you know, we're, you know, it seems like the, the elite and the lesser, the, the black, the white... Uh, you know, all kinds of div groups we get divided in. How do you as pastors respond? And even with the COVID thing, how, what, what's on your heart in this time right now? Like the most important thing you're dealing with, uh, Pastor Ray. First, let me say thanks for welcoming me to this table, inviting me to this table. Um, it's a blessing to be here. Um, I have the highest regard for you as my pastor. Joe, I've known even got me out of a ticket before when I was just uh, <laughs> a newbie in the Lord. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> and he's just been a dear brother for me, you know. Um, and, and just um, thanks, Rob. Yeah, no um, problem, man. Just getting to know you and stuff. 
stuff. And, um, now, you've been in Newark from 2006. You 2007. 2007. We started in the streets. The two worst projects in Newark at that time, one was on the south side called Seth Boynton Projects, which is no longer there. About um, three different sets of gangs um, in that development. And then on the north side, we would go to every week as well was considered the Grape Street Crips at um, Baxter Terrace projects. Mm. And um, that's how we started. We didn't have a building. There's two premises that I learned early on was you need a Bible and the Holy Spirit and you could do ministry. Everything else was just bells and whistles. And so, Amen. Um, mm. so we went out and we just started plugging away. And so, and uh, with this COVID thing, we're getting back to basic ministry. That's right. Person to person, home to home. That's right. And so, um, yeah, I think the, the Lord is doing some sweet things. If you look back right before, thank you. If you look back right before all of the COVID, right, there was different signs, right? If you, if you look at, say, Kobe Bryant's death, yeah. it showed you that nobody was exempt from death, mm. right? If you look at Kanye West, you know, and the whole Jesus is king and the music that he put out, it showed me at least and, and communicated to the world, I believe that no one is unaccept, unaccepted in the kingdom of God. Amen. Right? And so it My was favorite just things album. like that, right? And then the COVID showed you that, hey, we're all on equal playing field. All of us need to turn and look to the Lord in a time that was uncertain. Nobody been through this. We couldn't, I couldn't call my older pastor friend. Hey, Pastor Lloyd, what, what should we do in this? We were all in a position, whether you had finances or not, whether you were in one community or another, God, what is this? Because it was a worldwide event. Mm. And so leading to this, I personally believe whatever God has given us in that waiting time is now rolling out as he unfolds this next season. And so um, it's exciting to be at the edge of like some new stuff, some fresh stuff that God is allowing to stir up in his church and his body, um, dealing with us, but also, hey, we left the building. The church was mobilized, mm -hmm. and we've been in the church for a long time, no? And we've been getting <laughs> equipped. Now let's get it and put it to practice. Amen. And so that's what I've been excited about. So. I understand you were just recently involved in one of, some of the protests and how, how can you speak to that? What would you say about that encounter in your community? So I um, commend our community for the people who were from Newark standing and saying, we will not tolerate this happening in our city. The destruction part. The destruction part, right. thank you. And so if you know Newark, Newark can get real rowdy at any given time, right? So. Um, for the people of the community to stand up and say, absolutely not, for our mayor to lead that, um, for gang members to stand and hold the line and say, this is not going on here, for gang members to, to call at least me as a pastor and say, hey, would you go with us? Um, it, it already spoke to me that, hey, we're not trying to do what we used to do, what we normally would do, but... Um, we're trying to let people know we're not going to tolerate this. However, we're not going to be violent in this. If you invited me to that, we're not going to get violent, right? Right, right. Uh, we, we may stand up as men and say, hey, this is not what's going to happen. But, you know, in the, in the swinging, somebody has to be the peacemaker in the midst of it, right? And I hope I can Now, did, did you have outside groups try to come in to Newark yeah, and stir up trouble? Yeah, there was a lot of outside groups that tried to come in and um, destroy the downtown area and so forth. But... All the, um, the protests were peaceful. Yeah. And that's the stuff I think needs to be put on the news more. But like we talk, it doesn't sell newspapers, right? And so <laughs> peaceful stuff doesn't, unfortunately. Right. Sad to say, right. But it does one person at a time. Yes. And I think that's kind of the big thing I'm trying to sort out. You know, I mean, we're people. We're not, I don't look at you as a group, part of a group, part of a group. You know, oh, you're a part of the police officer group. Oh, you're part of the black pastor group. Uh, I'm the white pastor group. It's like, this is not in our thinking. Mm -hmm. So as an individual, how can we pass that on more to individuals? Joe, what's, what's your story? Well, basically, it's been one thing after another. You know, it was COVID, then it was the, the lockdowns, right. then it was, and it's sad because, you know, I know people in our church that are, you know, they, they don't have a job to go back to. 
people losing their businesses, people, you know, when you look at the TV, it's fear, fear, fear. They mm. said that COVID was going to kill 2 million people. And, you know, as a pastor, you have to guide the ship. Yeah. And even if you're feeling a little unsteady, you know, leadership is that you portray a strong demeanor and a calm demeanor to your, to your body. And I try to show our body that this is an opportunity. If it's COVID, you know, we had to be very creative in how we protected ourselves. You know, we have food deliveries. We had, on Friday nights, we had um, sometimes 60, 70 people come into our building. Now, our whole downstairs looked like ShopRite, you know what I'm saying? So we had to be creative and, you know, even the people who needed food were concerned. So we did kind of a drive up thing so they could get the food. Um, and then the shutdowns and then the loss of business and the unemployment and the fear and the counseling appointments. I'm sure you guys all mm -hmm. experienced that. Um, and then the, the George Floyd, you know, it's interesting because I had said this a while back. I said this COVID thing, the shutdowns and even law enforcement. And again, me being a former law enforcement, being put in these positions by these mayors and some of these leaders to force people out of Central Park to, and I actually said from the pulpit, this isn't a good look for law enforcement. This is going to backfire. And some police chiefs, and we live in very uncertain times. We have sheriffs in Michigan who were telling the governor, this is unconstitutional. We're not going to do this to these mm. people. We're not going to lock people up for playing ball in the park. Um, so there was all this going on. And then George Floyd happened. And listen, I know without asking you that we all agree that what we saw was mm -hmm. horrible. Who, who, have, you, have you run into anybody who wouldn't agree that that was the most horrific thing and sickening thing you'd ever seen? Not face to face. I've seen some really foolish Post, because people have a lot to say behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so I've seen some very foolish things. And then heartbreaking was um, to watch Caucasian young kids put out the Flo George Floyd challenge. And that's hmm. just adding fuel to the fire. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that my answer to that is like someone once told me, you can't fix stupid. You know, right. there are percentages <laughs> of people that are just out there. Yeah. What can you do? And on both extremes, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the average person, you know, in your congregation, Joe, in your congregation, is this stirring up more racial issues? Is this bringing some good conversations to the table? Well, I know for us, um, and I know a lot of active officers, and I just take an informal poll and say, what did you think of? And this is personal, right? Person mm -hmm. to person on the phone, and every single officer said, oh, it's terrible. You know, when I used to go into briefing when I was still in uniform, um, people, I, hopefully I can bring some healing to the subject. You know, people see the, the blue line, it's mysterious, but, you know, we're just people too. And I would go to the briefings and after, you know, they would tell us about what was going on in the town and the crime and stuff, it was just free time. And inevitably somebody would go, oh, did you see the video in South Carolina? And just like in one unison, black cops, white cops, who were like, oh, everybody saw that video. And it's going to negatively reflect upon us. And that, and that was the problem. See, painting with a broad brush, no matter who it is, or I know any, every cop I know, whether he's, uh, he or she is retired or active, I don't know about those stupid kids, but I can tell you that all the officers, they, they're proud of what they do, saving lives, bringing the community together, and this just sets them back. So. Yeah. So uh, in this whole idea of police officing, uh, why do police officers have to go in and just kind of take charge so much? It's almost offensive to some, but what is, is there a method to that madness or is there a reason? Well, I'll tell you this. If you this. show weakness, maybe that's a problem, I guess. You know, I'm going to say a lot of it has to do with training. I'm going to say that the city of, when I watched the video of what this officer did, and now I'm looking at it from a police officer, I'm looking at it from training. The guy's got his handcuffs behind his back. He's, uh, he has positional asphyxiation, all these terms that we learn. And I'm thinking, he's looking into the, ca this is why I say that it, it could be racism, it could be, the guy was a sociopath. Some people make it past the psych tests and get a badge and a gun and they shouldn't have it. A 0.01% mm. of the police force, these guys are bad guys. Yeah. And you know, just what he was doing from a training aspect, I'm like, the guy called out to his mother and, and he, he, he suffocated. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. forgot what your question was, but I got so well, emotionally enraged. Police officers with, do have to take charge yes. of a situation, but why is, is it over? I was on a ride along police thing in LA back as a young intern. 
And I was a little stumbled at how harsh the police came off in the city, you know, dealing with these people sitting in a park minding their own business, I thought. And of course, I got instructed, well, they were drug dealers and they were trying to just push them a little bit to find something out. And I'm thinking, wow, it's not a way to win friends and influence people. But, you know, that was then and yet it still seems to be a a mode of training, maybe. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, when I was a a new officer, one of the... It's almost like, I don't even want to say indoctrination, but, you know, I saw videos of all these cop killers. Mm -hmm. They were white, black, some were elderly, strangely enough. And what we were trained was, now they're trying to keep the young cops alive. They just got out of the police academy. We don't know anything, right? Mm. And we were to be hyper vigilant. But as you start to learn the job, you can, you almost get like a sixth sense, they say, as a police officer. But all these cop killers, there was dozens of them, and they interviewed them in prison. And one thing they all said, we said, why did you kill the officer? And they said, because he let his guard down. So this is what you're being taught, right, in Mm. the beginning. So you come out there, you're hyper vigilant. But I'm going to say this, where's the Lord in this? When you become a Christian, right, when I became a Christian as a police officer, my whole outlook changed, you know. And my thing was, well, if my life is going to be preserved or lost, doesn't mean I was sloppy. But my life is in the Lord's hands. And I try to have that influence on other police officers. It's really after about 10, 15, 20 years, and I know I'm going to get a lot of cheers from police officers who are listening or watching uh, when it happens, is that it almost becomes a miserable job. You see death every day. You see broken families. You see, and it almost like there's something that happens in your mind where you start to become calloused. Now, that's not an excuse. I did a lot of research on the former officer Chauvin, and he had 19 complaints, he shot people, he, and I'm thinking to myself, why was this guy even still on the road? Mm-hmm. He shouldn't have been even in contact with the general public. So training is an issue, how the city runs its police departments are an issue, and I'm gonna tell you this, cops don't like to work with bad cops. And I had a hand with other officers to get an officer fired in the town next to us. It wasn't a racial issue. But he was a bad cop, and he was negatively affecting people. And I can tell you this, when they finally fired him, we all rejoiced. So people say, the blue line, nobody crosses the blue line. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to work with that officer. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So, Interesting. so what are, let's, from a practical standpoint of ministry and ministering to real people in real time, getting away from the whole group and answering the racial issue in America, which I think is almost impossible because you're always going to have racists. How can we fix it where we are? You know, how, for, for example, on a, on an average day, it's a lot easier to just relate with people that you know and you like and you're, that are like you. You don't have to work that hard. If we're, honestly, it's really about laziness. I don't want to have to try too hard to understand somebody. It's easier, and I don't have to work too hard to let somebody understand me. If I'm with people that already understand me and I understand them, it's a lot easier. So naturally, we're going to be separated by groups in society. But the church is different. How can we begin to enlarge our hearts? Because if you only hang out with people like you, you're going to be very small-minded and small-hearted. You're not going to grow that much. But when you have to reach across to people in a different ethnic group, uh, economic class, and you get to understand them. Tell them their story. Hey, what's your story? I ask that people all the time. You know, how do you do that in your church? How does that work? Um, obviously, you have a number of black people in your church. You've got a number of white people in your church. Same thing here. We've got a mixture of just, it's a part of the culture here. But if, but if I hear somebody feels like disenfranchised, I know even in this issue, I've had some people from the black community say, Oh, Pastor, I love what you're doing. You know, you're doing it right. And then others have said, we're very disappointed in you, Pastor, that you're not speaking more about this. You're not doing this. So it's a real hard one for me to try to sort this out. How do you guys, how are you guys sorting it out? So someone sent me a message this past week and said, hey, are we getting together so we can say the same things, be on the same page with the thing? I said, look, it's real simple. Right. I'll I'll get together with people, but it's real simple. Right. Like this is just another event in the world. The world is acting like the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, We as believers have to remember the goal. The goal is souls. The goal is um, not saving America. The goal is not 
you know, um, this is my people, this is my property and protected. The goal really is for believers, the gospel. And they're hurting people, and we need to look at the heart of Jesus in the respect of how we deal with one another. And so on a leadership level, hey, it's real simple in the church. Like, hey, if you got biases, you need to get in the closet with the Lord, search your heart, repent, and get serious about engaging people that don't look like you, act like you, talk like you. Because even in our church, our church is, yes, it's in an urban context, but there's probably about five, six different cultures in our church. Mm -hmm. All right? So... Uh, why are people, you know, a lady came to me one time and said, how'd you do this? And I'm saying, like, I didn't. Like, <laughs> I really didn't, right? And it, it's just people coming together because, look, at our church, you, you, you're not going to really know, like, my politic position. You're just not because I'm about preaching the cross. I'm about building people up on the word. And so... I'm not allowing that kind of thing to divide us, just on a natural sense. And so, how do you resolve that in the pew? You challenge people, you speak to it, and you challenge people to get outside of their comfort zone. My, my, my um, experience was um, with other nationalities was broaden when I started getting involved in other areas, not just confined. So even what you shared with Vody, Vody, one of the things I really took away from that message was he was committed. Who is this Vody? Vody Bakum. Okay. Right? He was committed to taking his family outside of what would be considered the black church, and I hate that term. Yeah. Right? Um, and putting them, bringing his family into a more... Um, Caucasian setting, white church, right? right? Um, and what I really took away from that was the commitment. And it took me back to even when I walked in these doors. There was a commitment level. You know, people could, oh, you know what? You could go over here and, and you can go over here and, and the worship is this and the worship is that. And I'm saying, hey, I'm learning the word. And, and all those other pieces and legs and can feel uncomfortable. Hey, we'll work those things out. We'll get past that. And every single person that I've had a conversation with about personal biases in this church, around this church, and in this culture, we have deepened our relationship. And 20 years later, I can now say, man, you know what? If I never would have said anything to them, we would have just stayed on the surface with our relationship. Mm. Every person. And, and I can name names, but I won't. Right? <laughs> but so modeling that amongst people and challenging us, hey, you know what? This is something that God has pressed on my heart. Get uncomfortable for his glory. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're real comfortable. It is, and like you're saying, it's real comfortable to be around people that look like you, think like you, carry themselves like you. Right. That's comfortable. Yep. You get in the world, you got to wrestle through and then layers and layers and layers. It's like, who wants to do all of that? But when we're on mission with God's mission, his commission, that's the marching orders. Right? Like, we can pave lines, line after line and say, no, 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 no. It's another thing that's in our face that God is saying, hey, you need to paint the narrative as the believers because the world is painting a narrative for sure. Absolutely. And the world's going to embrace that as the narrative, but we have the opportunity to shine the light on the hill. So one of the big challenges, I think, is that we are going to have people in our churches that are going to be on the spectrum politically, be on the spectrum of even, you know, whether reparations or this issue, and they may not be in agreement with how best these things should be handled. Do everybody have to agree? Does everybody have to agree in your church to get along? If everybody had to agree in our church, I think it would be considered a cult. <laughs> like, yeah, no, good point. Yeah. All right. Um, I enjoy. Is there a cultic mentality in some of these, uh, uh, you know, groups that get out there and stir up trouble? It's almost as if they want to cause the issues. How do you keep those groups from taking charge? I don't want to take away from your first thought. You were talking. I. That's good. No, I just. Um, how do you keep them from? taking charge you know you've you've got different people with different mentalities and they they're not all going to agree right. 
How, how do you get them to come to the table and talk and even di- agree, agree to disagree, if you will? So I, I, I think remembering, again, the goal. And if we're going to resolve issues, we want the Bible to be our core. Right. Right. And really reason from the scriptures and that our hearts would be immersed in that and not in whatever... Um, wherever we get our news feeds from, because I see a lot of that happening in the church where, hey, I listen to this station, and so therefore this is what um, dictates my trajectory on how these things work in, in the world. And I'm saying, no, we have a, we have a directive. And, and if we follow that directive, when other people are trying or these groups are trying to, you know, over... Uh, power that, then we can speak to it from, hey, what would Jesus do, right? We had the bands for years and we were wearing that. What would Jesus do in this situation? Mm. What would God counsel us to do in this situation? What is his mind? What is his mind, right? And so having, we have that. The scripture says we have the mind of Christ, right? And so embracing that and taking every thought captive. I know there's some good ideas and all of that, but every thought, God, is this your heart? in how I should be engaging with, look, we look at the world sometimes and we forget we were, we were there. Sometimes we look at the world and say, how in the world is this happening? And we forget that the scriptures say in the last days that there was gonna be all kinds of anarchy and, and things going on. We forget that because we're so ready to fix it and protect our own. Mm. It's like, no, this is the mission. Let's go on the mission. So what opportunities have you seen arise out of these crisis times? What's been good in this regard? Joe? Go first. Yeah. Well, Christians have to remember, you know, when times are good, you know, and that they, we, we kind of lost sports stadiums. We, we lost going out to the diner. We lost, you know, the COVID thing kind of set us up. Mm. That people are stuck in the house and they're trying to figure out the new normal. And... It, I think it's good when the church becomes uncomfortable. And what I try to portray from the pulpit is, is you don't need me to tell you what to do every step of the way. You have the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. You have the Word of God. You have personal ministry. And I've been putting it out there. Pray about what is the Lord, now that he's got our attention, because all right. the distractions have been removed. And now we have this crisis. What is the Lord sharing with you? So I have a, I have a family in my church that... You know, we had a men's group, and he felt convicted, and he went home. He's got three kids. They started this ministry to feed hungry people, and, and it happened in a few weeks. And there's three different towns. They're going in Trenton. My wife and I are joining that. You know, we're going to go to the school and drop off food and meet people. Um, and it's very exciting because, you know, God is making, he's allowing the church to be uncomfortable. And the question is, what do we do with that uncomfortability, Right. Mm-hmm. And I think Christians need to be reminded of that we don't do things as a monolith. We don't, well, let's see what Pastor Joe says. Last night, and, and I was uncomfortable, right? And, you know, we're having this discussion about race. But I'm blessed because out of the four pastors on staff, one of my pastors is an older African-American gentleman who actually was ordained in the Baptist church. And he's been with us for years. And his name is Pastor Sam. And last night, we at a Wednesday night service, it was beautiful. And just his wisdom, his ability no matter what he hears and he experienced some really bad discrimination I mean I've heard his stories but him just you know me and him were sitting up there and it was so the 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 feedback that we got from our I don't we're not a big church was so incredible in the community and and I'm just thinking we're just praying see what the Holy Spirit says it just was such a great time and he he's talking about and I don't know what he's going to say right Mm -hmm. it's funny as a senior pastor when you just let somebody speak you don't know what they're going to say right but you trust them and he just talked about the relationship that he and I had, sort of like a spiritual father and a spiritual son and just his, his message of unity. It just, everybody was, was mesmerized in a good way to say, you know what, maybe I can be the voice for change. Maybe I can be the voice for unity and bringing people together. It is uncomfortable to talk about it, but I think it's a good thing. I really do. One of the things I think of, you opened um, in Sharon from the, the Bible verse week, the verse of the week or the right, day, right? right. Um, Acts 1-8. Hmm. And um, 
I just came out of, that's the last message I taught on verse one, eight, three, mm. three different pieces in that. However, going through Acts and just walking through those first eight verses. But what do you see there, right? You see that right before that it says, and you will be witnesses unto me when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There was a mission. There was something for the disciples to do, but they were first to do what? Wait. And we know that. And that can be the, one of the hardest things for a believer to learn. Mm. And I think in this season, the good that you asked was come out of this time of COVID. Although um, we have an extended family in our household, mm -hmm. God has taught us how to make those adjustments. But opposite from maybe what your experience was, um, our experience has been learning to wait on him because we've given, we've cried out, we've served in all kinds of facets. But God has said, hey, wait, just wait on me, just be still. And what we've seen and, and, and have been learning as a body locally is as we're waiting on him, he's deepening our hearts in him and crying out on behalf of a nation on behalf of our own sin. You remember Daniel partook of the sins that were going right. on. He said, we have sinned and we're learning that. And God is, I've seen manifestation of the gifts of the spirit as we've been showing up together. It's just incredible because it's organic. The word that people are sharing and it's the people that you normally would think like, absolutely, like they're so, but as they share, you know it's a word from the Lord. It's just so mm. fresh. And, and I tell you, one lady came to me and she said, what is the message that God is communicating to the church today? Isn't it one message? I said, well, think of it like a piano. Every local fellowship has something that God is teaching them. But there is a broader message that God is going to communicate and has been communicating. But we all must be fine tuned so that that message could be effective to the world that we're serving. Yeah, he's the, or he's the conductor. You know, That's right. We, we have a part, part to play. You know, we have, all have a part to play. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Robert, if you have any... Yeah, you know, I've been absorbing everything you guys are saying. And just one thing, just to go back to what you said, I mean, now as you look way back to the Kanye West era when he came out, and I'm just thinking this across the board here from him, COVID, and now what happened with George Floyd... What you said was interesting because what this has exposed is the church, the division that we have even within the body of Christ. Because even when Kanye West came out, you remember Pastor Lloyd? Yeah. We, we had emails, people, you know, oh, he's not real, he's not real. And we're like, wait a minute, relax. He, he, look at what he's pointing. Get the COVID, the pressure pastors have. Are you having church or not? Why are you listening to government? Then you get to this. Hey, what are you going to do? I mean, it's a constant yeah. thing. And it's what it's showing is where we are, where we are as a body of Christ as a whole. And perhaps God is kind of, that's the message he's saying, like you're saying, look where we're at here. We're not unified at all. You know, and here Jesus is coming soon. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what's going to happen here? How, how do we unify, you know, together and some of these issues that we, we're going through? And one thing I've been noticing, and probably you guys have here on social media, is now churches are going out doing prayer walks. Not protesting, prayer walks. Let's go pray for our towns. Let's go pray for people. Right. And they're gathering people, masses, and they're just walking through their town and just praying. And I think that's probably where we're going to unify ourselves is when we pray, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, right? We're praying to one God. We're not praying to different gods. As Christians, obviously. You know, in these times, that's exactly what happens. Uh, we get uncomfortable. We realize, God, unless you intervene, even when we come to our own personal problems, you know, that we can't solve. Maybe some intense fellowship in our marriage or with our kids or prodigals or you know some issues that happen that you don't know what you're doing i mean most of us time of the pastors we don't know what we're doing lord help us with wisdom but that gets us praying and i i i actually for the very first time this week began seeing all of these things instead of like i'm upset at the government's decisions mm -hmm. i'm upset at these wild groups that are come in i'm upset at all this misinformation from the media i realized this is exactly perfect for the church it forces us on mm -hmm. our knees and you know and if anything even when i'm having i this last week i was just having a real spiritual attack just it was a bad day i'm just in a mood can't figure it out i learned just to open the scriptures and just read and boy my father in heaven speaks mm -hmm. to me his word it's like comforts gives me hope gives me an encouragement and that whatever relationship i, I i'm not going to have an answer for all of this 
I'm not going to figure all this stuff out. But I know one thing. He loves me. I love him. And because of him, I love people. And I love people of all. And I want to I want to broaden my heart and understand different people. And sometimes I can I can speak those talking points that I've heard from other people and mm-hmm. and it creates these little skirmishes and and the Lord brings me mm-hmm. back. Just speak his word. And I love what you opened with Ray, you know. Get back to the word. That's where you find your answers. You know, you can all these news broadcasts and media and social stuff it's it just throws confusion sometimes in people's hearts it's very noisy you know it's a very noisy world right on both spectrums right i mean with everything from the news to social media to i mean the output of information from from kanye west to COVID to this i mean even as christians we're getting sucked into this stuff and uh, we're recycling all this stuff that it's really some of the stuff is bad and so like you're saying it's like like what pastor lloyd was saying how do you protect your church from this mindset coming into the, your own church from what they're listening out there, what, what their friends are telling them, because they're coming to conclusions that, that are not right, you know, and so it's, it's, it's a challenging time, I guess. It's being filled with the Spirit, right? Because the, the, the word there says, you shall be witnesses unto me, and that message is Jesus, hmm. right? Yep. That's, hey, you, you're willing to go at whatever extent to die with this message and meet people. Just meet people, meet, with, meet, meet them where they are, right? You see, I've made the mistake even coming out of a urban context. I grew up in a very urban context, made it out, lived the American dream. God, for some crazy reason, tells me <laughs> to go back into what we call the hood, which I'm <laughs> trying to call the neighborhood because we've taken the neighbor out the hood. <laughs> right? but, um, but, but he calls me back into that space. And, and it's like this thing where, where, God, why would you do that? And, and I lost my train of thought. I'm trying to <laughs> no, that, that, that hits it. Uh, will you be but, my neighbor? Right. And, and, and just really remembering, hey, as we're meeting with people, as we're hearing people, we need to not, I, I made the mistake of this. This is what I was going to say. When I first went into Newark, I had the truth. I knew, you know, I learned ministry. I have been involved with ministry. And I came with, listen to this truth. Mm. But it was more like Peter just cutting ears off. Mm. Yeah. Even though I had a lot of truth, I was sharp. Like you used the porcupine ex- example, right? Many fine points. Fine points, right? No one can get near you. That's right. <laughs> and that's how it was for a long time. God said, no, you're going to shut your mouth. You're going to listen. Mm. And I tried to model your example in our community. It doesn't work because God called me out to model, hey, the core things that I learned here, but not to model, hey, be Style. like Pastor Lloyd. Yeah, you got to be you. Right. And once God had showed me that and I grew out of that and I knew who I was in what he had called me to, it was more effective. And we want to do ministry that's effective. We don't just want to do a bunch of stuff. We want to be effective in touching people's lives. Amen. And so I believe, hey, when we know that is the the premise, like, hey, I want to see people's lives transformed, then I can't come at them with, hey, you know what, you better get your house in order. Where's the father? Get him back over. We can't do all of that. Nobody, they close the door and say, see you later. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. So when you're in your neighborhood and you're yeah. doing an outreach and stuff, yeah. you, you've gone through the gamut of, you know, the suburban church wants to come in and, and help out you with handouts and this and that. Uh, you, you look at that quite differently now because you realize that if you came and brought food to people, they really want not just food, they want conversation. They want relationship. They, they don't want it just a handout. Nobody wants a handout. Right. They want to know, do you really genuinely care about me as a person? And, yeah. and you brought that, you know, and I, you know, I, I see what God is doing. In fact, like you say, it's kind of an anomaly in the inner city to have such a variety of cultures together built upon the Lord Jesus Christ in his spirit. And something else about this witness, Judea, Samaria, Judea, or, um, Jerusalem, Judea, but they stayed in Jerusalem until persecution happened. Mm-hmm. Then they got scattered into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts. And maybe the Lord is using this to scatter us a little bit more so that he reaches a whole new world. You could also see 
the aspect of the Lord training his disciples and then he sends them out and they don't always do a good job and he's got to retrain them and send them out again mm -hmm. and you see a series of this in the Gospels and it's very interesting because I'm not going to say our local church but in general some of the things I see in the Christian world I've been preaching for a while about Christian complacency I've been preaching for a while about Christians just saying, well, the, the pastors will do it, right? Um, because this is, this is the mindset. And some of these ministries are all celebrity ministries. People attend, they consume, and then they go home. And that really frustrated me. And I talked a lot about personal ministry. And then COVID and, and all the things and where we are today. And I thought, gee, I, I really wasn't, this is pretty, this is pretty rough, Lord. <laughs> but it, you could see almost the Lord taking the church and saying, I've taken all the distractions away from you. I have presented you, or I don't say he did it, but you've been presented with a problem. Now, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, personal ministry is very important. And just as a, as a funny discussion, I know I shared this with you, is, you know, you go out and you pray every day and say, Lord, what is it that you want? As a senior pastor, I say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What are my goals? What am I here for? I don't want to become lazy and just go through the motions. But uh, six or seven years ago, it was kind of funny because it was, it was like an experiment. Um, we were at an outreach, right? And this African-American pastor came up and met my son. And he was starting to talk to him. And he said, hey, would you like to go to our youth group? And he said, yeah, sure. So we took him. So it was kind of cool. It was a local church. It was all black. There was not one person there. Mm. And I just said, now this is going to be interesting. You know what I'm saying? And he goes in and we, we used to joke around because for a long time, my son had very like blonde hair in the summer and he was very white. We said he looked like Casper the Friendly Ghost. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he didn't look like my kid, right? So um, we, we send him out there and he became a celebrity there. And I thought, this is good. I want him. You know, how's he going to react to a bunch of people? So different. That are different from yeah. him. And then I thought, well, how are they going to react to him? So he becomes like a celebrity. He comes, <laughs> he goes, I mean, we were going to another church, and we would send him, they just loved him. They fed him. I got to meet the senior pastor. The senior pastor did a panel, like a Q&A, and he invited me. Mm. And I, I, I felt honored. And we talked about cultural issues, racial, it was so, and that's the beautiful thing. We have to be, I guess maybe as a police officer, I learned to be fearless, but I also lead my congregation in being fearless. What is the Lord sending you to? Where is he taking you? And you, you said this before like when we were talking about being uncomfortable and, um, you know, how people stay in their social strata and yeah. their social cliques. And it, even in a church, yep. they're reticent to go outside of that to talk to somebody they don't know. But you know what? It's almost like the Lord set this up where you said the church has left the building. It's, it's all over now, which is what it always was meant to be. It's nice that we come into a building, but it's also cool, like the family that I was telling you about that's going into the cities, five, family of five, and they're feeding people. And I'm looking, and I actually called up the father. I said, how did you organize this so quickly? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like blown away. But it was the Lord who gave him that idea, mm -hmm. you know? What, as, you know, you mentioned story like that. And on the other side, mm -hmm. I mentioned the young ladies that are staying with us, which happened from a tragic situation. It started like that. But I had to get uncomfortable, right, um, to get on God's mission. I always said, nobody but our family is going to live in our house, period. I've always had that model before I got married, right? And so we get married. Um, fast forward, now we're here 22 years later, and these three young ladies are living with us. Um, but the big picture right? We're helping the mom to, you know, really get perspective about responsibility at the age of 41 years old. Mm. Um, our involvement with the girls, you know, hey, you got to get up at a certain time, you got to do your school and, and, and move on throughout the day with purpose. Um, we, we're getting them in the word daily, you know, and so these things have grown into that. Um, but further was this past weekend, when we went down to Pastor Chris's church, we, um, we hung out with the McCarricks and, and um, Colin and mm -hmm. so forth, and the girls were with us, right? So it's a team of nine of us now, right? And then on Sunday afternoon, we hung out with the Zacharies and then went down to the beach, and the kids come home like, when are we going back there? <laughs> right? And so their experience was brought in their mindset from what they thought 
they would find in white culture was totally erased. And what they received what the, was the reality that everybody is not like what I thought because of what I was told or what I assumed. Right. But the engagement caused for something deeper and to even go further. That young, the oldest one is 17. And we found out Friday that she's five months pregnant and she would have aborted if she wasn't in our home. Wow. So that was the Lord. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Right? And so... Now you're going to help her sort through that because this is what we do. Even the, the medical unit we have, the free ultrasounds and the ministry to women that are abortion-minded, it's great if we can get them to save that baby, but we also are looking to minister to them, encourage them, and help them sort. Life is messy. Look, there's all kinds of messy lives all around us. And um, James talks about not showing partiality to the rich. Um, some people use the poor and show partiality to them to build their power base. But there shouldn't be any partiality. Lord, what you put someone in my path. Our lives are intersecting for this moment. How can I be a blessing and encourage them? And I, I think, that, you know, even what happened in the early church with communion, Paul's rebuke to the Corinthian church because some had their big meals coming in and they weren't sharing with people in the love feasts. And he says, you're coming at Christ's table to be a part of each other and you're, you're not sharing your lives and I, and I think if there's one thing that the church needs to learn in all of these things is that we are not an island. We need each other. We need to be vulnerable to each other. Yes, someone's going to take advantage of you. You love anybody. C.S. Lewis said it well. Uh, you love anybody and you're going to be hurt. He goes, if you want to keep your heart intact, don't give it to anybody. Keep it in the coffin of your selfishness. But there it will, it will remain impenetrable, irredeemable. The only safe place from the dangers of love is hell. So part of us is taking that risk to say, Lord, here we are. We want to be a part of the answer. And um, and, and I I applaud your action in keeping peace in your community because that was huge. Even the relationship you had with gang members when you first went in, look at how it turned into a relationship to to influence them to do the right thing. Almost reminds me of Nicky Cruz when he was uh, mm-hmm. when he was tempted to he was gonna he was asked to take the offering and right. he thought he was gonna walk off with all the money. <laughs> right. And yeah, you know, that's what they're expecting me to do. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the right thing. Right. I have a story for that. Um, Bill Iverson, you know, I mentioned him before. He's the he's the son of the guy who wrote the hymn Spirit of the Living God. Mm. Um, now at the age of ninety five, but going back, he was in Newark during the race riots. And so when they were looking to bridge the gap between all the chaos that was going on between the community and um, the policing, um, they called him and he was the mediator. Mm. Why was he able to do that? He was able to do that as a white American in a black community because he had built relationship with the people in the community before the drama happened that then when it hit the fan, now, hey, this is the guy that could help because he was the one putting in the footwork. Right. And so it, it just shows that, again, when we, we step out and get uncomfortable and step into situations and learn and grow together and see, hey, you know what? We can impact people's lives, especially when we're gospel-minded and, and gospel mission then we can impact people's lives. If not, um, why, why are we Christians? <laughs> Amen. If, if I could just share a quick story about um, listening to God. And, and the reason why I want to share this story is because I know we had talked when we were eating about even race relations, police relations. And unfortunately, if the media, if the media would show the majority of the police officers who are doing good out there, and even white cops in you know, minority communities and such, I think the tone of the country would be better. It's almost like taking something very small and saying this is what they're all doing. And nobody likes that. Black people don't like it. White people don't like it. And police don't like it. I just share this one story because I think it's germane to what we're, what, what the elephant in the room is. Is um, Years ago when I was on patrol, uh, a young man was brought in. He was a black man. And... Uh, he was accused of doing something, so we had to process him. We had to fingerprint him. You know who I'm talking about. And um, me and Ray go way back. <laughs> and, and, um, it was me. No, 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 it wasn't him. It wasn't him. That was before the ticket, right? Exactly. So basically, uh, 
you know, it was, it was, it was, a, it was an allegation from another civilian. But we had to do our job in processing him and then releasing him. So to make matters even more interesting, he was also in the Nation of Islam. And it was a very, I, mean, I can say So he this, assumed he wasn't going to get a fair shake. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's where right, I was going. Right. But it was interesting because the Lord, and I can say this now that I'm retired, the Lord specifically told me, tell him about my son. And it's like when you hear that voice, you're like, you know, and I'm like, I ignored it the first time. At the third time, I realized he was serious about this. Mm -hmm. So I did. And it was late. I was tired. I wanted to go home. But he listened. And he, he was let go. All these white cops, including the white cops in my detective bureau, did the investigation, and we found out that he didn't do it. So we got together. We shared information. And we went to the prosecutor. And then we went to the judge. And by the time he came back, he, he probably thought, the, 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 all these white cops, I'm done. By the time he came back, we shared the news with him and his attorney, and um, the charges were dropped. I got to tell you, when he, his, he was very stone-faced, because I, I think he was very uncomfortable. When he came back, the guys were like, they knew him by, I can't say his first name, they knew him by his first name, they were shaking his hand, patting him on the back. He had a total different idea of the police, especially from when he came in. In addition, after talking to him, the guy ends up at my house for a men's group. I, I used to call my wife all the time. Uh, today I'm meeting with Nation of Islam. Today I'm meeting with a, a guy from the Pagans, the gang members, dangerous people. I said, just, you know, keep the lights on outside. Don't go outside. <laughs> like my poor wife, she's like, what's, what's today? And I just love to evangelize. So um, anyway, he became one of my best friends. I've known him for 20 years. He's a part of our church, and he's a born-again Christian. That's awesome. So, I mean, the, and I can tell you, we don't have a lot of time, but I can tell you a lot of stories like this that if people would see this in the media, that's mm -hmm. the stuff that gets no airtime. Well, it doesn't sell papers. It and doesn't. I think that's where people have to just get aware. When you read the news, when you listen to the news, it's like you're getting one, actually, it's in the hands of a handful of people that are, corp that are censoring exactly what the message they want to send, and they can point the camera where they want to, and which is what makes me concerned about this whole George Floyd thing. Horrific what happened. Mm -hmm. but, but think of the 300 trillion uh, videos and pictures mm -hmm. each year. What are the chances of us coming up with another one like yes. George Floyd, another bad guy that does something to uh, a black person? It's, all, it's only going to happen yeah. again. And how do we already have, like you say, something in place where whatever happens out there in the world, people know who we are in the church. Mm -hmm. And they know that we love people. And they know that, the, that whatever shade of color you have on your skin whatever ethnic background, whatever socioeconomic background you are, you're a person made in the image of Jesus Christ. That's right. And that's the message we have. Mm -hmm. I think some of that comes with um, getting out there and getting dirty. Yeah. Right? Um, not waiting for the church to come to us mm -hmm. or the people to be evangelized to come to us. But the called out ones going out on that mission and being mobile um, and because that's where they are. They're not here. They're not looking for the, hey, wh what do you find in the church? Do you find unity? Do you find hope? They're not going to go walk in here. That might have happened in the 80s and, and maybe in the 70s, and that's not today, right? Today they're out there. They have their stuff. They're looking at their social media feed. Um, just for every positive thing, there's 25 negative things, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's time for the church. We've waited. We should have been waiting on the Lord. And it's time to really move and really be what we see Jesus was when he said the Holy Spirit was upon me because he has anointed me to what? One of the things he says is to heal the brokenhearted. People's right. hearts are broken right now. And they don't have hope. And that's why they're acting the way they are, right? And so we have hope. We have something to mend the broken heart. We have something to recover the sight to the blind. Because maybe some people were walking in the truth at one time. And now, you know, they've gone off into all of this other stuff. But we can recover the sight to the blind. But it doesn't happen by just being here amongst us. It happens by getting in those pockets and in those places. That's why I'm not opposed. Somebody asked me, hey, 
You know, what, what do you think about um, being a part of protest? Well, why are you there? That would be the real question, not, oh, right. you know what, this is standing for this, then no, I can't be there. No, why not? Jesus was in the house of the sinners, mm -hmm. right? Matthew, the tax collector, had him at the house party. We normally wouldn't be there. Oh, no, we can't be there. No believers there. No, that's where you should be, you know, it, it, with discretion. Don't get me wrong, right? But in that place is where the opportunities are going to be found. You know, if I don't walk down the street into the community, I don't get the engagement that I would get if I was standing on the corner at the church property, even though there's people moving through. When I'm in the neighborhood after 10 o'clock at night, that's when they're out, that's when they're around, and I can pull them to the side and build with them. And I, I believe that's the context of every one of us, no matter where we live, and we got neighbors in, in suburban areas. Do we know our neighbors? You know, do we go to the grocery store and just not just move up and down the aisles and grab what we need, but really listening and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not just hear my gospel, but what rhema, what specific word does God have pressed on your heart as you listen to people to say, this is what it is that God wants me to say to you. Jesus so, with the woman at the well um, went out of his way that's right. to minister to that woman, and, but how patient he was with her how sensitive he was, treating her with dignity and respect as a person and, and winning her heart. And the longest personal conversation Jesus has with anybody in the Bible is this Samaritan woman, one of the ones over there, them, but he didn't see a them. He saw her. That's right. And that's what we need to see. We need to see. And listen, this is what I would say to every person listening to this. This is so key. It, it's about, look, we, we used to have uh, porches on the front of houses, you know, 50 years ago. Now we have decks in the backyard. So what do we do? Well, then have a backyard fellowship and invite all your neighborhoods. Have a backyard church service. You know, uh, if you can't go to church, you can put the church on the screen. Invite your neighbors. Reach out to people across the street. Reach out to those neighbors that you think don't like you just because you don't really talk and you're kind of different. You'll be surprised. Some of the meanest looking characters, I'll never forget a guy visiting our church when we were just getting started. He had a face that said, don't talk to me. And I'll never forget, after, I mean, I'm drawn to that kind of person. So I walked right up to him and I said, hi, how you doing? A big smile. And his big old smile came on his face. He introduced himself. And to this day, he's on, he, 30 years later, he's following the Lord, walking with the Lord. And you know what? It's one person at a time. You never, never know. And, and I want to say what you said was, pretty intriguing because, you know, protesting, you say, go out there, right, and, and be among the people. Kind of reminds me of like 9-11, right, when, when the towers came down, we went there. You right. know, we were waiting for them to come in here, and one person at a time, right, being there, listening, praying for them. Listening I, was key. Right, because I was, I was here, I was pastor in upstate New York, and we came out, and we, we set up a prayer, prayer station, we were doing that, mm -hmm. and we just, people came for prayer, and we went out and witnessed and whatnot, and what you're saying is the same as Go in the midst of the protesting, take one on the side, share the gospel, talk with them, hear them, listen to them, right, is, is what you're saying, right? That's exactly right. And, and, when it, and going back to that point of 9-11, what did you tell us? Put your Christian t-shirts away, <laughs> put your, take your tracks out of people's faces, but simply listen, listen to the people. Yeah. And, and that was great counsel. And that's what we have. You know, you, you go back, what, what was Chuck to the hippies? <laughs> right? Like, right. And that was a, a, a revival time, right? That wasn't him getting around some people that look like him, talk like him, act like him. It was him getting uncomfortable and engaging some rebels, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and really touching the heart of people through the word of God. Right. And that's the same kind of engagement that we have here. And we can say, oh, no. And what does the scriptures tell us? Don't be afraid of men's faces. Mm -hmm. No matter what they look like, no matter how they act, right? Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, mm -hmm. but of love, power, and sound mind, right? Mm -hmm. And so have that heart of love that he's given us. Right. And we'll help people have a sound and mind. And even if people are angry uh, or they're, they're unlikable, you know, it hurt people hurt people. That's right. You know, and when you, when you speak to the earth, if someone attacks you, challenges you. I mean, they might be a paid shill. There is enough out there, sadly, because of our enemies. But there might be some genuine people who are really, really hurt by this or that or something you might have even said or presented. You could take the time and patience to get into their heart, hear what, what's going on in there, at least give a chance 
for some real conversation and real, real hope. I have to commend you for having this forum. And, you know, you had said we need to get out ahead of this. You know, sometimes the church has been reactive when it needs to be proactive. And it's a great point. I, I have kind of a litmus test. You know, I had a young lady who writes fiction. And she said, my relative said that this isn't good. It's not Christian to do. I said, I have two questions for you. And you have to answer that question. Number one, am I pushing people further away from the Lord with what I'm writing, or are you driving them close, or, it, or is it innocuous? If you're driving people further away, depending on what you're writing, then that's a problem. You know, I, I have that same litmus test. There's a, a girl, young millennial girl, white girl, who said, I was at a few BLM protests. And she goes, I didn't know how my pastor would feel about that. And I, I applied the same litmus test. I said, when you go there, are you making things better? Are you bringing unity? You're bringing healing, or are you making things worse? Are you dividing people? And she told me, she goes, I had a placard. It was, I had scripture on it. And she said both sides. She said four policemen, because they probably saw the placards, pigs die and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so they saw her scripture. Four cops stopped her and said, that's a beautiful placard. And she was in the protest. Hmm. And then when trouble started, she was pulling people away from the trouble. I said, do you think that that would bother me? I said, that's fantastic. I said, if, if that's your ministry and you're bringing healing and you're bringing understanding or at least bringing peace, I said, that's a wonderful thing. So that's just my litmus test. And I say that, like you said, and that's important. When you turn on the TV, it could be CNN, it could be Fox, it could be MSNBC, it could be all these rags that we read as newspapers, and they're constantly, you read it and you get angry. It inflames that. So we have to be that counterbalance right. Right. of of bringing peace, of bringing calm, of bringing understanding. Blessed are the peacemakers because we will be children of God. We will be called children of God. So I just want to thank you for having us well, out here. Well, I'm honored that you guys would take out of your busy schedules because we're all working harder at this time, people will realize. They think, what are you pastors doing, sitting home and uh, hanging out? It's getting mm -hmm. creative with how to connect with people. You know, look, this is why we're in this. We love people. You know, God has given us a heart for people because he had a heart for us. He sent people mm -hmm. in our lives that rescued us and man, when you're rescued, when you've been touched by somebody, it's so encouraging. You just can't, you want to pass that on. And so that's what you guys are doing in ministry. And I'm proud of both of you guys, just what the Lord has done in your lives, the ministries, the open doors, and any way we can work together and serve together. So I'm honored you guys came. Thank you. It's that, that Romans 5.8, right? The, by, God demonstrates his love toward us by this, right? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I think that's the message that we have to remind people and ourselves, right, that, uh, you know, we're, we're in a world that's been tainted by sin, you know, so things are only going to get worse before they get better, according to Revelation, right, and so I think staying with that focus, gospel, um, you know, we only have about, uh, you know, another three more minutes, just some final thoughts from, from you, Pastor Lloyd, you know, Joe and yourself, uh, what do you want to tell people as they're listening right now to Bridge Bible Talk? We'll start with you. I think this is awesome as a entry right. into the discussion, mm -hmm. right? Like an introduction. You never fix this problem in 30, 30 minutes, an hour. That's right. <laughs> right? There's layers to it. Yep. But, um, you don't have the solution? I think, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. The Lord, that's it, right? But how yeah. we convey that message mm -hmm. and layers of how we work through those difficult things. Somebody's offended you. It's not to go tell 20 other people before you talk to that person. That's practical Matthew 18 model. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with even biases. If you fail, talk to them. Yeah. Right? And build. That's going to deepen your relationship. Stop keeping your relationships on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, this is getting involved in sharing life, right? And that's doing right. life together. Amen. And that's how these issues are healed and worked through hmm. I, I believe it's not just hey listen to this hour message yeah. you're right. gonna get it yeah, yeah. It's not right on sure. good this is a start yeah joe yeah i would say turn off your television <laughs> um because it's depressing good talk to your neighbors turn exactly. off your television talk to your neighbors absolutely and uh you know we just moved into a new uh, neighborhood a year ago and uh we've been we want to we want to know all of our neighbors yeah. and it's been great my wife has rescue horses so it's such a draw to people who are unbelievers and they they, they take their kids to see the horses i have bees and uh, it's just like an open door our house is an open door 
and strangers come in and we, we engage them, we get to know their names, we talk to them, and whatever. If the Lord uses the bees and the horses, uh, so mm -hmm. be it. But I would say to Christians, turn off your TV, get Amen. in the Word, get in prayer. You Amen. know, and I always try to minimize my position as the senior pastor. Yeah. I'm like, you go, you, all of you could yeah. they do the work do, of the ministry. They give more than I can. Yeah. So I want to encourage you to do that personal right. ministry. Pastor Lloyd, close it out. You know what? I'm so thankful that you joined us. Uh, pray for us as we continue to think of ways to reach out and minister to others. These are the Thank opportunities. Thank you for listening to Bridge Bible Talk. To watch past programs or for more information, go to ccob.org. If you have any questions or comments, email the pastors at bridgebible at bridgeradio.org. And join us next Saturday night for another broadcast of Bridge Bible Talk.